Today is December 11, 2023. As the U.S. continues waging this proxy war against Russia and Ukraine, we are hearing growing admissions from across the collective West that that the conflict is not going very well for Ukraine or its Western backers. There are now growing admissions that there simply isn't enough uh, equipment, vehicles, and more uh, specifically ammunition to transfer over to Ukraine to match, let alone exceed, what Russia is able to bring onto the battlefield. It is a war of attrition, and it is a war of attrition that Russia is winning. And yet, despite these growing admissions, we are still seeing articles like this. This was pointed out by Alex Christopher in a recent video. I'll put the link to his video in the video description below. This is from Foreign Policy. The shortest path to victory in Ukraine goes through Crimea. The West needs to keep its nerve, recognize the stakes, and support Kiev's clearest path to victory. But if you recall, the 2023 spring, summer, fall, and winter offensive, five months of heavy fighting by Ukraine, the whole purpose of that was to cut the land bridge, isolate, and even take Crimea. And we see nothing even remotely close to that actually happened. It was a strategic defeat for Ukraine. They lost multiple brigades in terms of manpower and equipment. And now they're in a weaker position than when they started, which is what I had warned about months before Ukraine launched their offensive. Now, here's how this foreign policy article begins. It says a pall of pessimism hangs over Western supporters of Ukraine. So they admit that there is this, this growing pessimism. There are these growing admissions, but uh, they think that it's just pessimism, that these admissions have no grounding in reality. With Kiev's counteroffensive underperforming, most observers' expectations, a fatalistic attitude bordering on defeatism, has set in from Washington to Berlin. NBC News and the German tabloid Bild reported last month that U.S. and European officials were uh, deliberating about an end to the war, as Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney told two Russians posing as African officials in a prank call. We are near the moment in which everybody understands that we need a way out. And what foreign policy is is talking about is certain people in the collective West facing reality, that they cannot win this proxy war, they do not have the means to do so, and they need an exit ramp out of this conflict. But foreign policy wants to see this conflict continue. They have a solution. However, they continue. It says, the truth is that there is no easy way out. Moscow has repeatedly made it clear that it will only accept Kiev's surrender and the latter's underwhelming ground offensive will only have emboldened the Kremlin. The only way to force Russian President Vladimir Putin from his objective is to give Ukraine the means to beat him on the battlefield. That is not an impossible task, but it requires the United States to keep its nerve, recognize the stakes, and identify the best path forward. But actually, it is impossible. It is literally impossible. There is literally no way the United States and Europe combined in the near to intermediate future can outproduce Russia in terms of weapons and ammunition. There is absolutely no way they can do it. As a matter of fact, even with the production expansion that they've announced, that they are pursuing, that they are successfully on track to achieving, even that is not enough to outproduce Russia. It'll still leave Ukraine uh, overwhelmingly underarmed. And yet, foreign policy claims that it's not an impossible task. In reality, it is. And here's their solution. This is what they say. In 2022, Ukraine achieved major victories, liberating nearly half of the territory which Russia had occupied since the start of its full-scale invasion. And we continuously hear this misperception repeated over and over again, all across the Western media, by Western politicians, by Western analysts, and it demonstrates a complete misunderstanding of what happened. Uh, they're talking about the Kherson and Kharkov offensives in 2022. Uh, so let's go over it one more time. Why not? Uh, there's still people uh, misunderstanding it, so clearly it needs to be repeated. In Kharkov, there were simply not enough Russian forces. Russian forces were elsewhere. They essentially gave up that territory. They had moved troops out of the Kharkov region and Ukrainian forces moved in. And uh, the worst part about this for Ukraine was even though there were no Russian forces standing their ground 
and putting up a serious fight. They were using their, uh, their advantage in long-range fires to take out considerable losses on Ukrainian forces as they moved into this territory. And of course, the moment Ukraine came up against Russian forces determined to hold their ground, the offensive ended. And then in Kherson, it was much more difficult. There, Russian forces were determined to hold their ground. They had a layered defense, uh, similar but on a smaller scale to what we saw this year during the, the offensive, the defenses Russia prepared for that offensive. And uh, Ukraine threw out brigades worth of men and equipment trying to take Kherson city. And they only took Kherson city because Russia made the decision to withdraw. They crossed the river. It was, uh, it was a, a perfect military withdrawal. Uh, Ukraine was unable to impose any heavy losses on Russia as it withdrew. It was well organized, well executed. For all intents and purposes, despite the PR, the, the political hit Russia took from withdrawing from Kherson city it was a strategic success. And in that process, they, again, they took out a huge heavy toll on the Ukrainian military. And people may or may not remember me going over this article many times. It's from the Washington Post. It's from September last year, 2022. Wounded Ukrainian soldiers reveal steep toll of Kherson offensive. So they're, they're admitting that this victory, victory came at a huge cost. And this is how the article begins. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I've gone over it many times before. In dimly lit hospital rooms in southern Ukraine, soldiers with severed limbs, shrapnel wounds, mangled hands, and shattered joints recounted the lopsided disadvantages their units faced in the early days of a new offensive to expel Russian forces from the strategic city of Kherson. The soldiers said they lacked the artillery needed to dislodge Russia's entrenched forces and described a yawning te technology gap with their better equipped adversaries. And isn't that exactly what we saw replay all over again, but on a much larger scale this year during Ukraine's five month offensive, uh, attempting to cut the land bridge and threaten Crimea. If you understand the reality of what actually happened at Kharkov and Kherson, you would have known months ahead of time before Ukraine even launched their offensive that it would be a complete failure. It would be a complete failure on a much larger scale than Kherson was. You, you may have anticipated that Ukraine may have taken some territory, made some gains, but you would have understood with absolute certainty that no matter where they stopped on the map, they would have had a depleted force, exhausted army, and they would be weaker and more vulnerable than when they began the offensive. So with that in mind, let's continue reading foreign policy, this article of theirs. It says, if this year's ground offensive proved less successful than anticipated, it has much to do with U.S. dithering in providing key weapons such as the Army Tactical Missile System, ATACMS, and dual-purpose improved conventional munitions. This allowed Russia valuable time to dig in. And they're missing the whole point of these cluster munitions that were sent to Ukraine. They were sent to Ukraine because the U.S. was out of high explosive rounds. That's what Ukraine actually needed for a successful offensive, many times more high explosive rounds than they received. So this wasn't a key technology that they needed to win and they were just given it at the last moment. They were given it at the last moment because they were out of high explosive rounds. Now, as far as the attack comes go, and as, as Alex Christoforo pointed out, and as I've said many, many times before, whatever weapon system you transfer over to Ukraine, Russia already has it and in much larger quantities. If it is a game-changing weapon system that can win the war, Russia will win the war much sooner than Ukraine. And in reality, these are not war-winning weapons. They're not wonder weapons. They're not game-changers. This is just a capability that they would give Ukraine that Russia already has and already has in much larger numbers. The Attackums is launched from the High Mars launcher or the M270 tracked launcher. Russia has the Tornado S. Uh, that, that is the guided rocket system that they use to fire uh, rockets similar to what HIMARS and the M270 normally fire. Then they have a completely separate system called Iskander. It's a missile complex. It has a range actually further than Attackums. That is their version of Attackums, a, a ballistic missile, 500 kilometer range. 
and they have many more of these launchers and many many more of these missiles to fire from them so how would giving ukraine more attackums ahead of the offensive made any difference it wouldn't have and we see them using attackums right now what what impact are they having? They attacked these helicopter fields. This was supposed to neutralize the threat of the K-52 attack helicopters that were so successful uh, fighting off the Ukrainian offensive. And I've heard Western analysts admit that the K-52 is still very much a threat. The attack rooms have, have done nothing to mitigate that threat. It continues, it says, in this new phase, the West should consider bolder and more creative options for supporting Ukraine. Rather than search for off-ramps that don't exist, it should focus its efforts on moving Ukraine closer to victory with a sustained focus on Crimea, which retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Ben Hodges has rightfully described as the war's decisive terrain, except that it isn't. And everything uh, General Hodges has said about Crimea has been proven demonstrably false. I will get in. I'll get into that as as we move on here. Let's continue reading what they say about Crimea. Without the liberation of Crimea, Ukraine will never be safe. The occupied territory is the key staging ground and resupply base for Russian operations in southern Ukraine. No, it is not. Uh, so if they don't even understand that, they understand nothing. Uh, military operations in in the south. Uh, they're based out of Rostov on Don. Yes, they use Crimea as well, but Rostov on Don, that, that is the primary uh, staging ground for military operations in the south. Everything that goes to Crimea is coming from Rostov on Don, for example. As a first step, Ukraine must deny Russia the freedom to operate from Crimea. That's why Kiev's forces have repeatedly targeted Russia's highest value asset there, the Kerch Bridge or the Crimean Bridge. I will refer to it as the Crimean Bridge, which serves as the essential the essential transportation link connecting the Russian mainland to the peninsula. Twice, Ukraine has successfully hit the bridge in October 2022. 2022 an explosion collapsed a portion of its westbound vehicle section and damaged a parallel rail line. In July 2023, a second Ukrainian strike temporarily destroyed another section of the bridge, limiting its operation for some time. And it should be pointed out that is back to full operation. The West should prioritize arming Ukraine with the weapons it needs to destroy or at least incapacitate the Kerch Bridge. Rendering the only direct connection between Russia and Crimea inoperable would put enormous pressure on Russia's other route to Crimea, which runs through the so-called land bridge, the long stretch of occupied Ukraine along the Black Sea coast. Now, there's so many problems with this, it's hard to know where to begin. But let's just go back to something that... Uh, I have said over and over again, you cannot isolate Crimea by taking out the Crimean bridge. Cannot be done. And to understand this, go back to 2014 when Crimea joined the Russian Federation after a very successful referendum. From 2014 until 2018, there was no bridge. It was part of the Russian Federation. Russia had been supplying the civilian and military a presence there on Crimea without a bridge and with no land bridge, surely with no land bridge. The land bridge wasn't established until as, as recently as 2022. So for years and years, Russia had been supplying the civilian population and its military presence on the Crimean Peninsula. And how did they do this? Here's the Crimean Peninsula. Here's the Crimean Peninsula. Here is the Kerch or Crimean Bridge. And you can see it, it enters in an area right around here. And what is right next to uh, the, the bridge? Ports, several ports, large ports. And if you zoom in, you can see these are, term these are cargo terminals and ferry terminals. And that is how people and goods move back and forth from Crimea to the rest of Russia. Uh, they also have several airports. Millions of passengers go to and from the rest of Russia. Uh, using these airports. So seaports and airports, that is how they're going to supply Crimea. This is, again, think about the Russian military operation in Syria. From 2015 onward, there's been this significant Russian military operation in Syria. They don't have a road or railway that goes from Russia to Syria. They're doing all of that by ship 
or by air. So there's absolutely no way you're going to cut off the entire Crimean Peninsula by just blowing up one bridge or even cutting the land bridge. It, it would make absolutely no difference. They would be able to resupply everything essential that is needed until they're able to restore the bridge and reconnect the land bridge. There's also this idea uh, in this article, foreign policy article, that if you have enough attackums and enough cruise missiles, uh, you can fire them at the land bridge, you can fire them at these bridges that connect Crimea to Kherson, and you could disrupt logistics that way. But we know even closer range battles waged as part of this wider war, say in Bakhmut, we saw both Russian and Ukrainian supply routes under uh, the opposing side's artillery fire control. And yet supplies continue to flow uh, back and forth uh, in and out of Bakhmut. And that is because even when you have something under fire control, it does not 100% interdict logistics. Logistics can still make it through. It's a little more difficult. It, you may be constraining logistics to a certain point. Uh, but you're not able to completely cut them until you physically control that route, which is why you see Russian and Ukrainian forces fighting to control these routes uh, with infantry. If you cannot interdict supply routes at close artillery ranges, you're definitely not going to do it at longer guided rocket or even further uh, ballistic or cruise missile ranges. You simply don't have enough missiles to do that. It, it is impossible. So the people crafting policies like this demonstrate a complete lack of understanding of how modern warfare operates, the capabilities of these weapon systems and what they can and cannot do. Then the article says the second phase of a Crimea campaign involves making the peninsula's naval and air bases unusable for Russian forces. This requires urgent and plentiful deliveries of attackums, including variants with a unitary warhead and a 190 mile or around 300 kilometer range. With pressure from Washington, Berlin can be persuaded to also supply the German-made Taurus, a powerful air launch cruise missile with a range of about 300 miles. But the problem is they already have Storm Shadow and Scalp cruise missiles. They have been given a certain number of attackums missiles. Number one, Russian air defenses are able to uh, stop many of them. Um, most of them, as a matter of fact, and the few that get through, they do their damage, but it does not disrupt significantly Russian military operations. They do not have enough of these missiles to actually significantly disrupt the usability of the Crimean Peninsula. Just think about it. Attack them, Storm Shadow, Taurus, Scalp, uh, the, the HIMARS, the M270, the shorter range guided rockets, all of these weapon systems that they have been giving to Ukraine, Russia also has, but in many, many times more numbers. Uh, we remember the New York Times article, will Russia overcome sanctions to expand missile production, officials say. Uh, this is from September 2023. And they admit that Russia is making seven times more arms, uh, ammunition, ordnance of all kinds than the entire West combined. And that includes things like Iskander, guided rockets, satellite guided rockets, and cruise missiles. If Russia with the same type of systems, but in greater quantities, cannot disrupt these areas where Ukraine is launching these attacks from, how is Ukraine with far fewer resources going to disrupt Russia's ability to use Crimea? It's completely impossible. It cannot happen. Uh, but they're citing the relocation of the Black Sea Fleet as some sort of piece of evidence that suggests it is possible that they'll have to move all of their operations out of Crimea, and it simply isn't so. And uh, Alex Christopher in his video actually pointed out this uh, post on X by General Ben Hodges. Ukraine has already proven the concept of long-range precision strikes can render Crimea untenable for Russian forces. Three storm shadows hitting key targets in Sevastopol caused relocation of one third of the Black Sea fleet. Imagine if Ukraine had 50 or more attackums or Taurus. And the point that General Hodges is missing here is that the Black Sea fleet was relocated uh, out of Sevastopol 
uh, off and away from the Crimean Peninsula, but it is still in existence, it still operates, and the threat that these ships actually pose to Ukraine are owed to their cruise missiles, which have a long enough range to be fired from their new location at targets in Ukraine. So beside the, the PR political victory of having these ships relocate, they're still firing cruise missiles that are hitting and destroying targets all over Ukraine. So it did absolutely nothing to change the strategic uh, setting on the battlefield, but it did score PR and political points. But if you're trying to actually win a war, you actually have to change things on the battlefield strategically, which Ukraine is incapable of doing. And that is something these strategies being laid out in foreign policy are incapable of doing. And in this post on X by General Hodges, he's revealing the flaws in his own logic. He's admitting that Russia is able to adapt to these attacks. They're able to relocate, disperse, harden various targets, and they're able to continue moving on with the military operation. It's not as if the Black Sea fleet moved and suddenly Ukraine started making all these breakthroughs on the battlefield. Remember, the Black Sea fleet in the Black Sea, uh, again, firing cruise missiles at targets where? On land. There is no real battle in the Black Sea. It is a land war. And making the Black Sea fleet move had, had really no impact at all on the land war. Russia will adapt to whatever Ukraine does with whatever weapon systems the West sends them. That's what they have been doing all throughout the special military operation, and they've been doing so very, very successfully. Foreign policy continues. It says, the third phase of a Crimea campaign consists of striking key facilities inside the Russian Federation. Russian forces pushed out of Crimea must be denied a safe haven, so they're admitting that they'll be relocated somewhere and they'll still be operational. They must be denied safe haven on the other side of the border uh, where they would otherwise regroup to launch their next attack. The United States has restricted the use of U.S. supplied weapons to target in occupied to targets in occupied Ukraine. Instead, Washington should assist Kiev in developing and manufacturing its own capabilities to strike Russian naval and air bases in Rostov, Oblast, uh, Krandestor, Krai, and other regions of Russia located across the sea from Crimea or bordering occupied Ukraine. Ukraine has already launched minor successful attacks against Russian bases, ports, airfields, and headquarters in these nearby regions. These attacks should be supported and encouraged. The problem is that while Ukraine has carried out these, these attacks with minimum impact on Russian military operations, Russia has carried out similar attacks all over Ukraine and has had a much, much uh, more severe impact on Ukrainian military capabilities. And that's because this is not a war of maneuver and strategy. This isn't a game, a board game of risk. This is a war of attrition. This is a war of attrition that Russia positioned itself for years ahead of time to win. And it is a war of attrition that Russia right now is winning. It continues, it says, U.S. policymakers should recognize that the shortest and most direct path to victory for Ukraine runs through Crimea. Ukraine must be armed, trained, and equipped with the campaign for the peninsula in mind. Just as Russia's war on Ukraine began with the invasion of Crimea in 2014, there was no such invasion of, of Crimea in 2014, so too will it only end when Ukraine eventually regains control there. For Washington, a clear eye on the campaign for Crimea is an anti antidote to the doom and gloom. Uh, by adjusting its strategy, the West can help Ukraine make crucial progress, weaken Russia and the Black Sea, and chart a path to ending this long and bloody war. A again, I have to point out that the entire offensive this year that Ukraine waged for five months and failed was designed to do exactly this. They were given all of these weapons, all of this trading with Crimea in mind, and it failed utterly, completely. And now they are in a much weaker position than they were before. So is the rest of NATO in terms of what they have on hand to supply Ukraine, keeping in mind the, the inability for them to ramp up military industrial production in the short and intermediate term. It was a failure. 
if you read this foreign policy article or you listen to Western analysts talking about different strategies they think might turn things around, if you really listen carefully, all they're doing is recycling things that they've already said and tried to do ahead of the 2023 offensive. And they're still clinging to a lot of these myths, uh, the, the Battle of Kiev, the 2022 Kharkov and Kherson offensive, how wonderful they went and how uh, if only they could recreate that success again, how great things would be. They're misunderstanding the, the absolute fundamentals of this conflict, which means they have no ability to formulate a, a rational strategy to move forward toward victory. They don't, they don't understand what has happened or what is happening. They have no ability to formulate a strategy that can change the course of what is actually happening and will happen on the battlefield. So I thought that art, that one article was a very good example of the type of thinking that we now see uh, gaining traction in the West. They, they're admitting that things are going poorly, but they still cling to hope that things can change. They cannot change. They will not change. The, the war is a war of attrition. Russia was prepared years in advance to fight and win a war of attrition the West was not. It takes years to reorganize your economy and your military toward that end, and the West simply does not have time to do that. So that is where we are with Ukraine right now. I would go to uh, the live map and show you, but really there, there has not been much change there. Fighting continues around Adivka. Russia continues a very slow incremental encirclement of the heavily fortified city there. And so other than that, it is still just more of the same. But even though the lines aren't changing, there is still death and destruction taking place all along the line of contact and, and far behind it on a daily basis. It's very important to re remind ourselves of that and to remind ourselves that this this insistence by the West cling to its hegemony over Europe, its insistence on of, of encroaching upon and encircling Russia and also China, this is resulting in proxy wars like what we see in Ukraine, and it is killing people every single day, oftentimes in horrifying ways. The better we understand this conflict, the better able we are to look for solutions to putting it to an end. Uh, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. In the video description, you'll also find all the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel or any of my social media platforms. If ads pop up, feel free to skip them. They're not helping me out at all. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee or through Patreon to everyone who has been helping out, whether it's month to month, one-time donations, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, helping get the word out there. All of that is very helpful. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you for watching.